Say we perform the famous double slit experiment but in three different settings with each setting dedicated to casting something different onto an obstacle. So we have this obstacle with two narrow holes S1 and S2 cut into it and the slit size as well as their separation is small in comparison to their distance from some screen. And we'll start off by casting macroscopic objects like, let's say, bullets that can be fired from a gun at some constant rate in random directions towards S1 and S2. Now, if a bullet passes through any one of the slits and hits the screen, we want some way of detecting it. So, of course, we need some detector, like a wooden box filled with sand to stop the bullets on impact. And this detector should be movable so we can move it around the screen and detect bullets at various places. Whenever the bullet is caught by the detector, we'll count that as some sort of click. And bear in mind we're talking about an ideal sort of setup here where we have indestructible bullets that won't break on impact with the slit edges so that we don't collect any half or partial bullets. All bullets collected are whole bullets or we collect them in lumps. Over a sufficiently long time period, we'll be able to collect lots and lots of bullets and then be able to speak of the probability of a bullet hitting the screen at a certain distance from its center. So let's treat the screen as an x-axis with its origin being the center of the screen and we'll define the probability of a bullet hitting some point at a distance x from the center as the number of bullets detected there divided by the total number of bullets detected at the screen. All that clicking at the screen traces out a pattern of bullet collection where we see that the fewest number of bullets were collected at the extremes and more and more bullets are collected as we get closer to the center. And if we want to trace out a probability curve, we'd find it to be more or less normally distributed about the center of the screen. Now to my trusted blackboard for some mathematical analysis. Now each bullet that hit the screen may have taken a path through S1 or it may have taken a path through S2. So let's modify the experiment first and then repeat it in a different scenario. Say we block off the hole S2 and let the bullets only pass through S1. In that case, we would get the probability curve P1, which looks like this. And if we perform the corresponding experiment for blocking off S1, then we would get the curve P2. And if you excuse the coarseness of my drawing, we see that the sum of the two probability curves P1 and P2 does give us the combined probability curve P12, that is, the case for when both the slits were open. So that means for the case of bullets, we conclude that they arrive in lumps and their probabilities add up, the probabilities for different routes to the outcome that is. Now let's try the experiment in the more familiar setting of having a source of monochromatic light illuminate the slits and by diffraction we now have a couple of coherent sources of light. What follows is the constructive and destructive interference of light waves giving us the famous alternating fringe pattern on the screen where the bright fringes mean maxima for light intensity and the dark fringes are light intensity minima. We can now plot the intensity on the screen as a function of location on it and get the interesting yellow curve that now warrants some more mathematical attention. At any point x on the screen, we have electromagnetic radiation emanating from both S1 and S2. So let's talk about the electric field contributed by both sources. That means at any point x on the screen, we have the vector sum of these two electric fields. Now the probability of detecting light somewhere on the screen is proportional to the intensity of light observed there. And intensity itself is proportional to the squared magnitude of the electric field vector. So we're just going to set them equal by some super convenient choice of units or whatever. So each source contributes its own intensity, whereas the observed intensity on the screen is equal to the squared magnitude of the sum of electric field vectors. So it's clear that the observed intensity is not equal to the sum of individual intensities contributed by the two sources. We say that there is interference involved. And this inequality is also confirmed by the so-called single slit interference patterns, which are pretty interesting in terms of the math and physics involved there. So yeah, it's definitely worth checking out a couple of Khan Academy videos on the topic of single slit interference. Anyway, we can observe this interference effect mathematically as well, and it's not really that hard. All we have to do is take the I12 term and expand it using the knowledge that the squared magnitude of a vector is given by the dot product of that vector with itself. So just perform the necessary vector algebra and we get this cross term which is very important. We see that we have this relation between I12 and the individual intensities as well as this phi1 minus phi2 term which is something called the phase difference at that point x on the screen. It's the phase difference between the electric field vectors over there. And this entire term is something called the interference term. The phase difference arises because of the difference between the distances the light has to travel from S1 versus S2 to get to some point X on the screen. 
Okay, that was pretty cool and relatively easy, but there's an even cooler way to describe what's happening using one of my favorite tools, complex numbers. So this time the electric fields from S1 and S2 are described by complex numbers where the value of omega here is the angular frequency of the light, which is of course equal for both the sources. And the so-called amplitudes here, E1 and E2, are complex numbers because we want them to contain the respective phase terms. So now the individual intensities are given by the squared absolute values of these complex numbers. And at x on the screen, we have the sum of these two complex numbers giving us the electric field over there. And again, for the intensity, we have the squared absolute value of the sum of E1 and E2. And again, we see that the sum of the individual intensities contributed does not equal the observed intensity. So we know that there's interference involved and we can observe it mathematically this time using complex numbers by recalling that the squared absolute value of a complex number equals the complex number times its complex conjugate. So expanding and performing the necessary complex number algebra, we have these two really weird looking cross terms that don't look like an interference term right now, but just play around with the polar form of these complex numbers and we'll find that we have exactly the same interference term as the case for vectors gave us. Okay, cool. So that sums up the case for light waves. We see that there's interference among the various paths involved in getting to the outcome that is landing on the screen. And the interference can be, can be described mathematically using complex numbers, which is both extremely cool and will come in handy quite a bit during the later part of this video. And now for Feynman's famous thought experiment, whereby we don't need the bullet firing gun anymore, but we do need an electron gun. That could be something like a tungsten wire being heated by an electric current causing thermionic emission of electrons. The wire is encased in a metal box that has a small opening in it to allow the passage of some electrons. And the wire is held at a negative potential relative to the box so that the electrons would be accelerated towards it. And some electrons would escape the box through the opening and then be projected towards the obstacle in random directions. The electrons projected are of nearly the same energy and they're detected on the screen in case they pass through the slits by means of some kind of counter that could be something like a Giger counter or anything of the sorts. Now bear in mind this is completely a thought experiment. It's not some experiment we can set up practically like the other two experiments we just talked about. It's a thought experiment because it's impossible to design an apparatus small enough to observe the effects we're about to study. However, the results we would get have been confirmed by other experiments actually conducted to study the quantum mechanical behavior of electrons, but they're less easier to think about, so we're just going to go with this one. Okay, so our thought experiment is set up and we allow it to continue for a sufficiently long period of time, enough time for us to make some observations. We hear many, many clicks over the course of the experiment and they are somewhat erratic. More importantly, we always hear a click of exactly the same loudness as every other click, meaning that whatever is being collected at the screen is always one whole lump. It's going to be one electron. We don't have any half or partial clicks corresponding to half or partial electrons, whatever that means. And the relative probability of finding an electron somewhere on the screen is proportional to the average clicking rate over there. Now for the boring part of the experiment. If we were to trace out the clicking pattern on the screen as well as a probability curve, we would get some not so surprising results. Yes indeed, just as expected we have this alternating fringe-like pattern corresponding to an accumulation of electrons around certain locations on the screen and no or very few electrons everywhere else. And the probability curve that looks quite similar to the intensity curve we got for light in the earlier experiment. Okay, I admit. Maybe that was a tiny bit surprising, but hey, let's introduce some mathematics to describe what's going on here. Okay, so we know that the electrons hitting the screen follow a path either through S1 or S2. And just as before, we're going to make a modification to the experiment, whereby we block the hole S2 so that we know for sure that the electron hitting the screen took some path through the hole S1. And now using the average clicking rate, we will trace the probability curve P1, which looks pretty reasonable. And if we perform the corresponding exercise by blocking off the whole S1, we get the probability curve P2. And it goes without saying that the sum of probabilities here does not give the probability for the case where both slits were open. So we're inclined to say that there's some kind of interference going on, similar to the case for light waves. But wait, how can we describe what's happening mathematically? Well, the good news here is that the shape of the curve P12 provides a hint as to what kind of mathematics we need. 
quantum mechanics provides the answer in terms of complex numbers called probability amplitudes that we're denoting here by the letter psi. And the probability for an event to occur is given by the square of the absolute value of its amplitude. So psi1 squared gives the effect when only s1 is open, and psi2 squared gives the effect when only s2 is open, whereas the combined amplitude for the case when both holes are open is given by psi1 plus psi2, and the probability distribution for this case is the square of the absolute value of this resultant complex number. And again, we see why the probabilities don't add up like we would expect them to. So the mathematics tells us that there's an interference among the various probability amplitudes. Okay, cool, the mathematics is adding up. The math is mathing. But there's still plenty to uncover from the discrepancy we saw among the various probability curves. The curves were obtained under completely different experimental circumstances. One where we actually knew which path the electrons took and one where we did not. Now let's remove all the barriers we put in place and come up with a way to watch the electrons as they pass through either hole on their way to the screen. We can do so in principle by placing a light source midway between the holes. If the electron took a path to the screen via, say, S1, then we'd see a flash of light in its vicinity because the electron scattered some light over there. So we know that the click on the screen originated from the hole S1. We duly note that observation, and over the course of many clicks and flashes, we have the curve P1', prime, which is pretty much the same as P1, and a similar case for the curve P2'. Prime. Now, what about the curve for an electron hitting the screen regardless of whether it was from S1 or S2? Well, just forget that we were watching the electrons altogether and add the curves P1' prime and P2' prime in agreement with the clicking rate at the screen. We get the curve P12', prime, which looks nothing like the curve P12. What just happened here? We seem to have disturbed the behavior of electrons, and the physics behind it is actually pretty simple. We see a flash because of the scattering of photons by electrons. And whenever a photon of certain energy collides with an electron, there's bound to be some momentum exchange, and that momentum exchange alters the trajectory of the electron. For example, if the click was supposed to be detected at a sort of bright fringe on the screen, the change in trajectory could take it to a dark fringe where we should never have had an electron. We're inclined to think that the solution lies in disturbing the electron in a more gentle fashion by using less energetic light, like red light or even radio waves, and we could detect the flashes by using some mechanism to see them. Well, that lowers the disturbance on the electrons, no doubt, but now, because we're using longer wavelengths, the flashes become fuzzy. And we can no longer determine clearly if the flash occurred in the vicinity of S1 or S2, and the resulting curve P12 double prime looks a lot more like the curve P12. On the other hand, the solution of using dimmer light sources means that there are less photons to scatter, so lots of electrons would just pass by without ever being detected. So if we watch the electrons, we disturb them and the probabilities add up. On the other hand, if we let the electrons be, then we cannot determine which path they take, and the probability amplitudes interfere. The electrons we're detecting on the screen are indeed material particles, but their behavior in getting to the screen is wave-like. We're now in a position to summarize everything we've learned so far, but first, a huge shout out to my Patreon supporters who helped make this video possible. So, to sum it all up, for an ideal experiment, each event has a probability amplitude, the square of the absolute value of which gives the probability for that event. If an event can occur via alternative routes, then the probability amplitudes add up and there is interference, there is a superposition of probability amplitudes. However, if we can determine, even in principle, which alternative path was taken, then the probabilities add up and the interference is lost. And there you have it. That's a wrap for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Drop me a follow on Instagram as well. And please let me know of your feedback in the comment section. Thank you. See you next time.